today's seminar. Uh, I'm Haldev Sandhu. I'm Associate Professor at EIDC and I'm the Chair for the Seminar Committee. And it's my pleasure to introduce our seminar uh, speaker for today, Robert Hawkmuth. Good. I'll take it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, uh, his nickname is Bob. That's easy to pronounce for me. Um, Bob grew up uh, grew upon a large vegetable farm on the eastern shore of Maryland and has been an extension agent for 40 years. His current position is 50% regional in nature, uh, in nature sporting commercial vegetable extension programs in the Suwannee Valley area of North Florida. His overall responsibility is the development and implementation, implementation of educational programs for commercial field and greenhouse vegetable producers, basically to increase their knowledge of production, incorporating principles of efficiencies, profitability, and environmental awareness. Bob is also serving as the assistant, direct, assistant center director at the North Florida Research and Education Center. So um, with that, I would like to uh, ask Rob to take over the floor. Uh, just a quick reminder, please keep your microphone on mute. Uh, you will get a chance to ask any questions at the end of the seminar. You can also type in the chat box, but um, please keep your microphone on mute for during the presentation. Thank you. Yes, perfect. All right, thank you. Um, sorry for that little delay. Uh, so we're going to be focusing on the protected ag industry, but I'm only going to be focusing on a specific part of it. And that's going to be the uh, fresh fruits and vegetables and uh, herbs to some extent. Um, but it's not going to include a pretty significant segment of the protected ag industry where we have greenhouses that are growing uh, vegetable transplants, for instance, uh, non-edible horticultural crops, bedding plants and ferns and those types of things. And it also is not going to include the, uh, the cannabis production, all of those which are under protected agriculture. But today, uh, I want to focus on the edible fruits and vegetables uh, and the industry that is, uh, is expanding in those particular areas. Um, over the uh, several periods in my career, um, I've been part of surveys where we've uh, gone out and tried to document the amount of acreage in production and the first survey was as you see back in 1991 it was a relatively small industry at that time essentially all vegetables uh, tomatoes cucumbers and lettuce were probably among the only things that we really found in the industry at that point in time and it sort of oscillated a little bit uh, up to 100 acres around 2001 but around 2010, we knew that something very significant was happening in the increase of uh, greenhouse and other protected structures uh, that were growing vegetables. And so you can sort of see the 2013, which was the last real serious, seriously detailed documentation that we did. We found 386 acres of uh, primarily vegetables, but some uh, under blueberry protection, protection at that point in time continued to grow uh, 2018. And uh, the acreage uh, here in 2022, I'll give you a little sneak preview here in just a moment of what we think is going on uh, here now. Um, the diversity changed, the kinds of production systems changed, but uh, over the last decade is really going to capture the period of time when most of this expansion occurred. So in 2013, our uh, formal survey that we, we worked through county extension agents throughout the state, we worked with our industry partners throughout the state that supply greenhouse structures or, or uh, hydroponic systems, perhaps, and try to do as exhaustive a survey as we possibly could. We found that there were 240 growers that we were able to identify of various sizes and that total acreage at that time, uh, just a little bit less than 400 acres. And you can see on this map at that point in time, there were more operations and larger acreage uh, in the southern part of the state. And I've drawn this sort of arbitrary line uh, through, this, uh, through the state, Levy, Marion and Volusia County on the northern part of that uh, particular divide. And so you can see that there was a lot more 
uh, operations in the southern part of the state, but yet we were able to find operations scattered from Escambia uh, to Miami-Dade County and everywhere in between. So it was a very, uh, very diverse uh, industry, not necessarily any one particular pocket uh, like we might see in the field lettuce industry or field tomatoes, things along those lines. It was, it was more scattered throughout the state. But recently, I had the opportunity to spend some time to try to at least informally go out and figure out what was going on in the industry, talk to a lot of my colleagues throughout the state within the university that are working in these areas. And we found that there is at least 500 acres of protected agriculture for edible fruits and at least, but I, I think it's safe to say, for me to say that there's well over 500 acres of, of vegetables as well. But just on the conservative side, I feel like I can reach and touch 500 acres of each fruits and vegetables. And this is a definitely a moving target. Uh, every week I will get uh, calls for folks that are somewhere in the state looking to uh, start some type of a vegetable operation in particular. And they may get referred up here for uh, just an introduction and, and uh, have a little question and answer period, perhaps. So the industry has, has significantly in, expanded in size. I want to first just sort of share a little bit about the ed edible fruit crops that are being grown under uh, some type of protected culture. Uh, I don't work specifically with uh, the fruit crops. So don't know a whole lot of detail, but certainly am, am able to share with you that uh, carambola and blueberry are two of the crops that are being grown. Uh, the carambola under sh more of a shade uh, protected culture system and blueberries typically under a high tunnel. So of the 500 acres, blueberry would, be, would represent one of the more significant acreages uh, within the fruit crop industry. Uh, there's probably at least 200 acres of, uh, of high tunnel blueberries across the state. Uh, one large operation in, in this area around Gainesville uh, that's been in, in that particular system for probably six or seven years at least, maybe even more than that. Uh, the other uh, significant acreage would be the citrus under protective screen, the CUPS production system that IFAS has been involved with. <clears throat> and this system is, uh, is using the protected ag aspect to be able to screen out psyllids and help uh, reduce or prevent uh, greening. And so there is, a, there is another large uh, acreage of this particular system for uh, citrus in the state. So between blueberries and the cup system and citrus probably represents the majority of that uh, 500 acres of fruit crops. As I work my way through here, I just want to kind of point out there's a number of different kinds of uh, technologies that are being used in these protected ag systems. So uh, what we, we have, first of all, the glazing type materials or wherever the covering is, whether it's plastic or shade material or insect screening. But in addition to that, there are a number of other uh, kinds of supportive technologies that are being adapted. The two top slides here is some work that we were doing with reflective mulch and uh, putting that around uh, greenhouse and uh, helping to reduce the likelihood that some of our insect pests are even going to get close enough to the house and be brought in. So the combination of the reflective mulch and the insect screening on the intake side of the greenhouse uh, ended up in some of our on-farm trials, reducing uh, the, uh, uh, the incidence of things like whitefly and aphids, but whitefly in particular, whitefly aphids and thrips uh, by more than tenfold. So a lot of those insects are flying insects, and when they fly over the reflective mulch, they, they kind of get confused uh, because they are mostly oriented to the sun. Uh, in their flight pattern. And uh, on the day we were putting out this particular trial uh, on the farm, even though I, I could understand that sort of that the, the flight pattern is going to get uh, messed up when they fly over this, we had a volunteer, uh, huge, uh, one of the giant Florida stink bugs, volunteer to, to show me how exactly this happens. <laughs> and uh, that stink bug flew in and landed directly into the middle of this highly reflective area. 
And uh, once it landed, it tried to get up and fly away and it would get about maybe two feet off of the mulch and then it would dive bomb straight back down. So I, uh, in, in my simple way of thinking about this, it was when it was on the plastic, it would look up and it would only see one sun. And then when it would start flying, it would see the, the, the reflection of the sun uh, out of the metallized mulch and then would dive back down. And it did that episode for maybe 20 times until it got to the edge of the reflective mulch and then just flew off naturally. So if we have a big enough barrier on the outside of some of these uh, structures, we can reduce the, uh, the incidence of pests by utilizing this kind of technology in a very unique way. And of course, there's yellow sticky uh, materials, either cards or in this case, uh, big, big bands of it that are also implemented uh, from a plastics uh, standpoint. So as we work into the specifics of vegetable crops, um, I just will uh, kind of point out here that traditionally uh, we've mostly had an industry of tomatoes, cucumbers, and lettuce. So if we were back in the 80s and 90s and somebody said greenhouse vegetables, you probably would be thinking almost exclusively about tomatoes, a little bit of cucumbers, and a little bit of lettuce. But today uh, the norm really is diversification, especially on our smaller operations. So we've gone into all kinds of different crops uh, that are present now, and we, we were able to reveal those in those, uh, in those surveys. Um, but you can see the, see the diversity on these kinds of pictures here, uh, even including in some cases cut flowers, uh, where they'll select certain types of of cut flowers that are uh, are not going to be out competed offshore, uh, things that don't ship very well from other parts of the world. So whether it's zinnias or sunflowers or other kinds of cut flowers that even finds their way into some of these local markets where growers have been able to do a really good job under some type of protected structure. But the point here, I think, is that it used to be just a few crops uh, that were grown hydroponically in greenhouses, but today it's it's much 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 broader than that. In terms of the size of operations that we see, uh, there are only a few really large operations, and I have arbitrarily selected five acres or more as, as those large-scale operations, probably no more than maybe 20 um, uh, that are of that size. And I'll show you a little bit more about that as I, as I work my way through. But um, the slide on the left was a uh, a uh, uh, five acre greenhouse tomato operation that was in this area just a few miles from our research center um, was very successful over a, a long period of time. Um, and the grower has uh, sort of since retired out of that has been very successful and very profitable in, uh, in that particular venture. <clears throat> we also see some large high tunnel operations as well. Um, but the point on this part is that there's only a few of them that are really large. So that means that we have a pile of relatively small operations, maybe only a single or a double bay. Uh, and I think of a single bay as about a tenth of an acre. So you're talking about many, many operations that are a quarter of an acre or less that are tucked in oftentimes near urban areas where they're able to capitalize on the, uh, on that, um, on the urban areas for the market. Uh, for retail and, and typically in some of our areas get really high prices uh, in those areas direct to consumer. The production systems are also varied. Uh, there's some native soil production under protected culture. Uh, and then I've listed here a number of other kinds of systems. Uh, some of those are substrate or soilless media based. And in other cases, like the nutrient film technique and deep water culture are basically solution systems only. There's no media other than growing the transplant that would be involved in those at all. But you, you'll find all of these uh, scattered throughout the state. Certain crops typically are done in certain production systems, uh, but you'll find these production system options all over the, uh, all over the state. This is a, a new operation up here, maybe 30 miles to the north of the research center here. Um, and this is only a portion of this operation. You can't get the whole operation in one screen uh, without maybe a drone. Uh, but this is uh, the operation known as Cultiva. And Cultiva is originally from 
uh, from Europe or from Italy. And that's where they started their, uh, their operations. This is the first venture into, uh, into this production here in the United States. And they're looking to expand to other locations as well. Um, so this is about 130 acres um, and a portion of it is uh, certified organic, um, probably 20 acres, uh, something like that, but no more than 20 acres are in certified uh, uh, organic production. The rest of it is, is conventional. This is what it looks like on the inside of these tunnels. It's a highly mechanized, highly modernized uh, system. Uh, they have uh, the ability uh, for forced air cooling of the product in their packing house and then ship out from there. Uh, this is all baby leaf products, lettuce, spinach, and arugula would represent uh, the main three. Um, most of that acreage, probably 40% or more uh, in lettuce, uh, about the same in spinach, and then maybe 10% in arugula, something along those lines. The lettuce component of it has, has been what has expanded over the last four years or five years since they started this. Um, the operation, interestingly enough, is located in Hamilton County um, near the town of Jennings. And they selected that area to try to get as internal to the state as they possibly could and get away from the highest risk of hurricanes. So they had a very strategical decision to, uh, to be made about where they were going to locate uh, this operation. Um, but if you see uh, baby leaf spinach this time of year, chances are that's the operation where it's coming from. And um, they, their marketing arm is not exclusively, but a partner in that operation would be Taylor Farms. So uh, most of you are probably familiar with that as the, as the marketing end of it. But anyway, huge operation. Uh, it's been really great to work with them. A number of different research programs that we've uh, been able to conduct with them on their farm and have some even going on right now. Uh, looking at some disease management uh, within that operation. So uh, all ground culture, no, uh, no soilless uh, media culture at that particular operation. The, uh, <clears throat> these, the smaller types of operations that we find are typically going to be uh, targeted at retail markets. And some of these are down, down south and you can see sort of the diversity of crops that are uh, that are grown in these types of operations um, because of, in most of the direct marketing stuff, you don't want to only take tomatoes or only lettuce. You want to be able to have a diversity of products so that we can get as much money from Herman Sandoy as we possibly can. And we can get more if we can sell him four things than we can one thing. But they're typically very diverse. Just give a sort of a brief review that it used to be that when we talked about hydroponic tomatoes, we were talking about beefsteak and it was sort of a signature to have the sticker on the beefsteak tomato. Um, but today uh, it's, it's quite different even within the category of tomatoes. A lot of interest in heirlooms, some of these smaller specialty types of varieties, uh, tomatoes on the vine or cluster harvest tomatoes that you might see on the left-hand side here where an entire uh, cluster or hand of tomatoes would be harvested and kept together uh, in the marketplace. So even within the tomato industry that, that we've seen this, this, uh, this expansion uh, today to, to providing more specialty kinds of tomatoes, maybe higher flavor than what we typically maybe used to have uh, available. We also have uh, peppers that are, uh, that are being grown, and uh, the, the biggest interest probably is in colored bell peppers, which almost require a pretty significant type of structure, either a high tunnel or a greenhouse, uh, to be able to do that. Um, but we do have pretty simple systems that you see in the lower left and the lower right uh, that are growing bell peppers in open shade and selling as a mature green pepper. Uh, it's difficult to get from the uh, green to the red stage without uh, a significant amount of uh, fungicides and other kinds of uh, crop management techniques as we go, but there's some that are just at adding this method on as a way to get bell peppers added into their crop mix in a very simple and inexpensive way of being able to do it. Normally we think of peppers that are not gonna get much, much higher than um, you know, uh, the, the, the height of your thigh or so, maybe two or three feet at the most in the field, and then they stop. However, peppers are perennial crops. We just treat them as annuals. 
And if we take that excess sun away from them in the summertime, they'll continue to grow. So you see the slide on the left-hand side, that was a crop that was planted up here in March, and we harvested it all the way through the summer into the fall and finally terminated the crop in November when we started getting freezes up here. So we took what normally is a relatively short harvest period and turned it into a very extended harvest period. When we go through the summer, we typically don't get quite as uh, large a fruit size over that period because of the, of the stress, um, but then it picks back up again in the fall. So that's been an interesting, uh, interesting way to, uh, to, to continue to try to expand the offerings that a grower might have for as many months of the year as they possibly can. And that's really one of the key things. I'll be talking about that uh, in a bit, a little bit more for lettuce in particular. We also have seen the emergence of many cucumbers uh, in greenhouses. It used to be the, uh, the, the cucumbers on the lower left there, the larger ones, maybe 12 inch uh, shrink wrapped cucumbers would, would have been the standard. But today, uh, these mini cucumbers that have all of the same attributes, they're parthenocarpic, so they don't have any seed in them. Uh, they, they, they're uh, equal, if not better than the large cucumbers. And one of the advantages is that they don't have to be shrink wrapped. The little ones don't have to be shrink wrapped. So one of the dilemmas is that if I buy one of those big cucumbers and, and uh, there's only two of us at home and uh, we eat part of that, and then what do you do with the rest of the cucumber? They're very sensitive to chilling injury when you put them in the refrigerator and they'll tend to have little sunken pits in them. Um, that look like some kind of a disease is attacking uh, attacking them, but really that's the symptom of chilling industry in, injury when we put these cucumbers inside uh, refrigeration. So with the minis, they don't lose moisture through the skin quite as rapidly, so we can leave them out, maybe keep them cool, but don't have to put them in a refrigerator, and I can eat one today, one tomorrow, and one the next day, and it sort of fits our consumers really well. So we see a rapid, we have seen a rapid experience expansion of these mini cucumbers uh, over time. Right now, I would say the main expansion crop-wise is with leafy greens and lettuce in particular. Um, and we have a number of different ways that lettuce uh, can be grown. Uh, these slides are all nutrient film technique. Many of them are at uh, are from the research center trials that we conduct here, uh, and the other uh, it would be a large scale NFT type of uh, type of an operation. But uh, typically here you just have the nutrient film technique, which it means that up on the if you take the slide on the upper left, uh, there's a feed line that goes into that channel. The channel is slightly on a decline, so the the uh, the solution drains down that channel and bathes the root in this nutrient film and then is recirculated. So it's a closed loop system and the only uh, substrate that there would be would be something like maybe rock wool uh, that we would grow the transplant in before we set it into the, uh, into the channel. But uh, there's a lot of expansion in this uh, nationally and, and a lot of expansion in, into leafy greens here in Florida as well. You can grow these leafies and some of the herbs in uh, open trough systems and containers uh, as well. So uh, some of the soilless sub substrate that might be used uh, up in our area, we have access to composted pine bark, which is a good deal. Um, so in some cases, that's the least expensive uh, substrate to be used, but also coconut fiber, mixes of peat, vermiculite, perlite. Uh, there's all kinds of different uh, substrate mixes that can be used either in an open trough or in individual containers. The, the slide on the lower right is a picture of how coconut fiber is used. Coconut fiber would come as a sort of a, um, a, a dehydrated compressed block inside that bag. And as you add moisture, it expands, typically expands seven times the size that the dehydrated block would be and fills an individual bag or fills a lay flat bag, whatever the, um, whatever the container would be. So coconut fiber uh, is an is the type of substrate that has expanded pretty rapidly in the industry over the last 10 years as well. There are a couple of types of uh, vertical systems that uh, are used. Some using media, the, the slides on the left and the right here would be the vertigrow system that does have a soilless substrate in it. 
Uh, and then the tower garden in the center um, would be um, more of an aeroponic type of a, uh, a system there where you have the rock wool cube perhaps as the as the only media and then the water comes in at the top and bathes the roots as it goes down through the uh, tower and then is recirculated from that reservoir in the bottom back up to the top. So again, a closed uh, system, whereas the vertigo system is not closed. It would be an open, uh, open system. In the, uh, in the Vertigro system, we've done a number of trials over the years looking at different media, just sort of put this slide up here to, to, set, to sh just sort of as an example of some of the research we've been doing in this particular area, uh, comparing 100% cocoa fiber to 100% composted pine bark, and then a couple of different mixes um, using a, a standard variety like Tropicana for this. And uh, very little difference um, in, in yields typically when we do, uh, when we see these different types of substrate mixes, um, but they might individually have to be managed a little differently. One might hold a little bit more water than another one. One of the challenges here is to keep everything uniform from the top, uh, top pot to the bottom pot. You can see that in this case, the, there is a black pot uh, underneath all of it where the uh, solution would drip down into that one and we're growing Swiss chard uh, just to capture that extra nutrient that would flow through the uh, th th flow through the tower. Floating systems or deep water culture uh, mean the same thing, uh, but these systems are large pools of nutrient solution and some type of method of floating uh, the crop on top of that uh, on top of that solution. So you can see a, sort of a large commercial scale on the left, and then a market um, small farm on the right hand side where they built four by eight uh, individual frames. And, but yet using the same concept there of having the nutrient solution and, and then either known as a floating system or deep water, deep water culture. We also have a really nice cooperator up here that is uh, Trader Hills Farm um, in just outside of Jacksonville. Uh, they're in an aquaponics uh, production system uh, and using the deep water culture as the method of growing the lettuce and utilizing the fish waste that would come into this into the system. Uh, and they have a, a pretty unique marketing deal there, mostly direct to consumer or direct to restaurants um, and, and do a really nice job um, with, their, uh, with their lettuces. Uh, and I just make a point that this is one operation like several others that when it gets to the summertime, we have some challenges. So the greenhouse temperatures, the ambient temperature will go well over hundred degrees, no matter what we do. And so oftentimes in the past, we've had a situation where the grower has to terminate the crop and take a rest over the summertime, yet the market is still there and still demands for them to continue and provide lettuce, for instance, for as much of the 12-month period as they possibly can. So we began five or six years ago working on uh, different simple systems to try to figure out a combination of uh, cultural practices where we might be able to extend into and through the summer. And if I was a lettuce grower, be able to grow lettuce for 12 months of the year. So <clears throat> this is a, a early cropping cycle here, but it, it shows the good visual where they, we're in an NFT system and the solution goes to the right and comes in through the big PVC pipe into the uh, the recirculating container, the reservoir down on the floor there. Then from there, it's pumped up outside or out of that reservoir through a little chiller. So it looks like a little window air conditioner and is very, very similar to that. But that chiller is made specifically to bring down the temperature of uh, the solutions like we are using here in nutrient film technique. Bring the temperature down, try to keep the solution temperatures down into the mid 70s or low 70s as much as we possibly can recirculate it in. And uh, we've, we have found uh, great success in being able to put together the combination of these practices, uh, even if the temperatures, as you see here on the left, 104 degrees that day, ambient temperature and 91 degree humidities. We've all, all experienced that. But as long as we can keep the roots chilled uh, down in the 70s, 
um, and hopefully not have many hours where it even gets up into the upper 70s or 80s, then we've been very successful with this. In addition, we're using other practices like, uh, like shade. And, and on our greenhouse, we have, we've impl implemented Illuminet, which is about a 50% shade material. You can't use much more than 40 or 50% shade total uh, on these greenhouses because at, at some point we begin, even though we can reduce the temperatures a little bit, we reduce the critical level of light that the plants need. So a maximum of 50% shade and the chilling uh, are, are two of the things that we've done. We also uh, have found that we, we have to lower the concentration of the fertilizer when we get into the real hot part of the year. And typically we would run our electrical conductivity of this solution at about 1.8. This time of year, it would be about 1.8, but in the summertime, we gradually drop it back to about 1.2. And the electrical conductivity is just is a measure of all of the fertilizer concentrations in that solution. So the more fertilizer there is, the higher the electrical conductivity number would be. Just sort of caution folks here that uh, our uh, that that number includes whatever the base well water is. So the electrical conductivity of our well water here is 0.4 but you might be near the coast where you get some saltwater intrusion into wells and the electrical conductivity at the start might be 1.2. So I just caution you that uh, I don't want you to go out and set yours at 1.2 because uh, it's a lot more complicated than that. You have to know what the starting well water is and then figure the parts per million of the different nutrients on top of that. But the shading, chilling the roots, uh, root system and lowering the EC have all been key components of making this work. The opportunity that this provided us was to uh, to partner uh, with Herman and and bring some of his breeding program to our hydroponic protected ags uh, area. And so we've been working through one of the seeded specialty crop uh, or alternative enterprise grants here that uh, Dr. Sandoya was able to get. And we have served as a location for him to be able to evaluate his breeding material up here. And he has some fantastic breeding material coming al along specifically for this type of production system. Some of the uh, cultivars or some of the line breeding lines might not necessarily fit perfectly in a field scenario, but it might be exactly what we're looking for in terms of uh, characteristics for our, um, our protected ag program. So this has been a very interesting and enjoyable, and I think it has, uh, has proven to be uh, really good for Herman to be able to, to look at, uh, at maybe some potential new markets in the future for some of his materials. And I would just say that specifically, uh, we could we could use improvements in romaine for in terms of what's available to us currently uh, in the romaine category for uh, hydroponic greenhouse vegetable production. Definitely could uh, could use some improvements. So we're excited to be able to look at uh, a lot of uh, Herman's uh, breeding lines. I think typically we're, we're evaluating probably twenty or twenty four of his lines in comparison with. Uh, maybe eight or 10 or 12 of the industry standards all in the same trial. The picture on the upper left here, we're doing a lot of data collection when we do the harvesting uh, for him. And we're doing all kinds of stuff, taking certainly measurements on, on uh, the total yield in terms of weight. We're looking for tip burn. We're looking for bolting. Uh, we're also uh, taking measurements of, uh, in, in this case, soluble solids that uh, we're, we're just getting a sort of an indirect measure, trying to collect anything that we possibly can. And then there's been some additional uh, post-harvest analysis that have been done with these, uh, looking at different vitamin contents. And I think there's just some really fascinating information coming along there. So that probably is another topic for another day. But uh, ultimately, our goal in this, in this thing is to be able to help growers to successfully adopt these technologies to make it work in their operation. And this is one of our local growers. He's actually been in production for more than 30 years and has grown all kinds of different crops. Um, but he has adopted this, ser this uh, series of 
techniques and is producing lettuce uh, and selling lettuce 12 months of the year, uh, some to restaurants, some at the farm itself, but uh, essentially all direct sale uh, kinds of kinds of activities here. So this is just sort of ultimately for me, this is what I love about the job is being able to sort of uh, work on the research phase of things, see how we can maybe make some uh, adaptions and then ultimately have a grower that is successfully able to uh, adopt those technologies. Um, as I move along here, move out of uh, lettuce and into some of these other specialty crops, um, whether they're herbs or edible flowers, um, microgreens, all are very popular today, and um, especially for these local local markets. So um, this this is an this is an important area of our specialty crops within the greenhouse industry. And the last time that we did a survey, I just mentioned here on in the case of herbs. Um, we found that there was as many acres of greenhouse herbs in the state of Florida as there was tomato at that time, which is sort of mind boggling from where we've been over the past uh, 30 years to, to think in terms of tomatoes almost taking a back seat to some of these other uh, kinds of specialty crops, but that's the reality of where we are uh, here today. The slide on the left is uh, in the uh, several different types of herbs and even nasturtium as an edible flower, but the herbs are uh, the things that fit really well into that system are the ones that you harvest and let come again. So if you got basil, you harvest, let it come again, harvest, let it come again so that you're not having to replant in that same uh, production system. Um, but anyway, we see a lot of interest in these kinds of highly specialized crops. I borrowed a couple slides from a collaborator here that I work, work a lot with, uh, Dr. Selena Gomez, and uh, she's on campus in the Environmental Horticulture Department and, and is one of several people now that have expertise in this area. If I go back you know, to the beginning of my career here in Florida, there, there were not very many faculty members that were involved in protected ag in any shape or form. But today we have uh, experts throughout the, uh, the University of Florida IFAS system that might know something about greenhouse environmental management, might know something about crop nutrition. Uh, and, and in Selena's case, she is sort of a practical level of putting it all together, but especially is familiar with the lighting aspects of, of things as well and manipulating uh, the crop through through different types of LED lights. Uh, it used to be that it was really difficult before LED lights to make this kind of indoor agriculture profitable because of the expense of lights. Um, so I think LED sort of brought, a, brought more attention uh, to this industry and has helped to make it um, a, a bit more uh, economically feasible. And a lot of this industry, of course, came out of the marijuana uh, industry where, um, to some degree, uh, the production systems and all are very similar to what we're doing in our other crops. And in fact, a lot of our publications, even though we can't write a publication specifically for marijuana, um, we do know that there's, uh, there's certain publications that we have, one in particular that is a, a fertilizer uh, management publication that my brother George and I, uh, George wrote, and I've helped uh, keep it up to date over the years. And uh, that particular one helps a grower to be able to, to, to build their own fertilizer recipe. And so when we get to the end of the year on the reports of accomplishment, and we download the number of times that a publication is, is downloaded, that particular publication does not fit the others in the vegetable category. So you might get 5,000 downloads on the tomato one and 8,000 on the cucumber or whatever. And then you get to the fertilizer one and it's 50,000 downloads. And you think, what in the world's going on there? But I think that uh, the likelihood is that it, it really helps uh, the marijuana growers to be able to fine tune what they're doing, even though it's not written specifically for, uh, for marijuana. So just a little sidebar there of an unusual uh, use of a, of a, of a publication. Um, but anyway, we can uh, look at the lights and uh, change uh, the quality of intensity of light to be able to make plants do different things. Uh, just uh, I'll, I'll be in very thin ice very quickly on this, so I'm not going to allow myself to get too far in other than that we now have a lot of knowledge, even within the University of Florida here alone, to be able to help to determine uh, how we may be able to modify a crop that we're trying to sell. In the 
in the, in the enclosed uh, containers, uh, we also have to be mindful that uh, things like carbon dioxide are going to need to be provided uh, in a greenhouse environment. When the fans come on, we bring ambient air in that has plenty of carbon dioxide in it. So we don't typically think of CO2 injection in a greenhouse or a high tunnel or a shade house for sure. But in these enclosed containers, we need to be able to provide uh, carbon dioxide uh, to, the, to the operation and we're able to do that. Just sort of to, to finish things up here and then be uh, very interested in any questions or any, any conversation that we might need to have. Um, but this uh, series of slides is our newest adventure here at the North Florida Research and Education Center, Suwannee Valley. And uh, this container was delivered to us just before Christmas. And then we uh, had a big crane came in on the lower right-hand side. You can see the, what's happening there, which, uh, shifting it from the tractor trailer that brought it down from Massachusetts, put it in place. And uh, we're going to be, uh, we're going to, we have already started now, but we're, we're going to be doing work uh, in this indoor container, uh, which is eight feet wide and 40 feet long. And this project is, is one that is funded by basically the electric cooperatives here in the state of Florida. So this was a competitive process to be able to, to, to win the opportunity to, to do this work. And so Swanee Valley Electric, the Swanee Valley Electric Co-op is our local electric co-op. Seminole Electric is one of the major power providers to other co-ops in the state, uh, the University of Florida, and then uh, EPRI, which is the Electric Power Research Institute. So other than the University of Florida, those other entities um, have been have have put this program together. EPRI has, uh, I think, thirteen or fourteen other containers like this one scattered throughout the state. We're the furthest south of all of the locations, and what they're interested in finding out is what the energy ramifications to the grid would be. Um, and in this type of production. So right now it's a very small uh, item perhaps to the electric industry, um, but they want to know what the, what the impact could potentially be. So they deliver this container and we have uh, about 18 months where we'll follow their protocol and we're going to be growing kale uh, in the, in the, just like all of the other locations will be, will be growing, uh, growing kale. And then there's a number of different environmental management, um, a bunch of environmental management equipment there that will send information to EPRI and other partners. Um, and we, I've got about uh, six or eight other faculty that are involved with this, many from campus that have special interest and expertise in this, that are going to be able to track this and will be able to, to use that in their own teaching research, and for us, certainly our extension program here, uh, this is going to be a win-win for the University of Florida uh, for sure. And it's going to be an area that I need to learn a lot more about. Um, so questions on lighting and things like that, uh, this is going to be, uh, I, I believe, a, a really good thing. The local electric co-op has been over backwards to make sure that this goes easy for us. They've done all kinds of things to try to help us to get this thing hooked up, put in place and, and up and up and running. Uh, so we're really excited about this new opportunity. And we've now added this onto our protected ag um, footprint here at the research center. If you take a peek into this, this is what it looks like right now. We're in the process of growing the transplants on the left-hand part of the screen here. There's a, there's an area dedicated for growing the transplants and then the transplants will be planted into these panels that are behind me in the picture on the right. So the plants are inserted into those panels and the water nutrient solution runs from the top to the bottom and, and basically uh, is able to provide uh, the nutrient solution to those plants. The, uh, the left-hand part, it's sort of in front of me, would be the light panel. So I'm standing in between the light panel and the crop panel, and there are four of these uh, of these combinations within the uh, within the uh, container. So uh, the light on the left provides the the lighting for the crop that would be on the right. 
so forth and so on. So it's totally automated. We can run this whole unit from our cell phone. Uh, Wanda Laughlin is our protected ag manager here, does a terrific job, and she's uh, commanding the ship at this point in time and sending information to EPRI and anybody else in the team that needs the information to try to see what's going on, how the temperature, how's the temperature management, what's the, you know, all the bells and whistles that go, uh, go along with it. It's a very expensive uh, proposition up front. And the, uh, the, the, the difficulty of sourcing materials and the cost of materials uh, has made this uh, investment significantly more, perhaps almost as much as doubling it from eight years ago, five years ago, four years ago, uh, just the cost of getting materials uh, shipped in and get the containers themselves uh, shipped in. So um, we'll also be able to analyze the uh, economic components of this. And uh, really looking forward to, 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 to getting a lot more information about it. So just in summary, I just I look at this as just a technology rich area. Um, and I've listed on the right hand side all the different kinds of technologies that we're using to make this protected ag industry uh, as profitable as possible and try to help growers uh, to be successful as they move into this or expand into this. Uh, from their farming operations. So um, with that, I will uh, pause at the end of the presentation and be happy to, uh, to have a discussion however you would like to go from here. Okay. Thank you very much, Bob. Um, it was a great presentation. So it's time for the questions. We have uh, almost 10 minutes. So if anybody has any question, please unmute your microphone and you can ask. I have one question in the chat box. The question is, is there a list of farms that directly sell to the public? Um, in certain areas, there are. Um, I know there's some, some local nonprofits that tend to do this. We don't maintain that system ourselves. So uh, there may be somebody else in the, in the audience here that would be able to answer more specifically for that area. But I do know that there's some small farm um, groups that try to identify, uh, identify those direct to consumer operations. Um, but but we're, I'm, we're not maintaining anything. I see Michael is listed localharvest.org is one of those that uh, you'd be able to go on to and, and find uh, find those farms. Thank you. Uh, hi. Oh, sorry. Uh, hi, Dr. Hotsmith. Um, I know your brother very well, and uh, I took all of his classes. He's amazing. <laughs> I really um, enjoyed the presentation especially the soil uh, list media trial results. Um, so I was looking um, at the slide and I believe there was coconut fiber and um, composted pine bark. Uh, using that soil list media uh, method um, and uh, I think you said it was a less expensive, expensive alternative. Uh, did you see any difference in like the yields um, compared to with soil than without? Um, you mean with the, uh, in comparison to ground, ground? Yeah, culture? exactly. Um, yeah. Uh, we, that was not part of our trial there. Um, and I couldn't agree with you more about my brother, by the way, he's, is amazing. It's been hard to pedal to keep up as fast as he, he and I, at, at, some, <laughs> at some point I gave up on doing that. But, uh, anyway, uh, uh, the it would be difficult to do the soil comparisons because the because of the population and and so with the towers you're going to get a lot higher population um, so specifically to answer the question when we did those vertical uh, trials in the vertigo system and looking at the different media uh, it was just a comparison of the different media within that system so um, I think that it would be fair to say that for a certain amount of space when you go up vertically you're going to be able to get higher yields on a per square foot basis than you would on the flat ground culture I think sometimes those numbers are exaggerated in terms of what's potential there um but uh but oftentimes um you you are gonna you are you should be able to get a higher yield uh per square foot in those vertical systems 
Very cool. And then the floating systems with the deep water culture. Uh, just out of curiosity, how much does a system like that cost uh, to operate? And does it like take a lot of energy? Yep. So if you if you think back to the slide where you had the four by eight boxes, uh, other than right. the materials to build that, um, there there is no uh, there is no energy that would need to go into that particular uh, system. So for a small operator, um, you we we're not even adding air stones to it, um, and have been quite successful with just the floating styrofoam, the basket, and then when you put the transplant in the basket. Uh, as long as we have one tip of one root that touches the nutrient solution, the root system then takes over from there. So um, in terms of blurting out a specific number, I think we used to be able to build those boxes for something in the neighborhood of uh, maybe 50 bucks. It probably is double that now if you had to go buy the lumber and materials. But, um, but you can build a small system like that very inexpensively. Um, on the other hand, if it was a large scale like the aquaponics operation where you've got pumps moving water and circulating throughout, that's a whole different story. And there you are having to put energy, uh, energy into it. Um, and so uh, I, I don't have any specific numbers for you, but those are two very different scenarios, both of deep water culture. But we do find a lot of novice uh, folks that maybe have not been farmers before that find those small floating uh, systems very easy as an entry into being a farmer and taking those types of uh, products to the farmer's market, let's say. So I don't know if that answers the question sufficiently. Yeah, it did. No, it did. Yeah. Awesome presentation. I really enjoyed it. The stuff is really, really interesting. And please send your brother my regards. Thank right. you. I, I will. Um, the other thing that I would add is that oftentimes we're comparing the deep water culture to nutrient film technique. And one of the advantages of the deep water culture, if you do have a uh, power outage, uh, those floating rafts are going to be fine for a period of time in terms of nutrient solution. However, in a nutrient film technique, that is not the case. So you have to be able to have a backup system to be able to continue that circulating that nutrient film technique or on a hot day, they'll run out of solution very, very quickly and you could lose the whole crop in a matter of 15 minutes, 20 minutes, half an hour. So yeah. there's a lot, of, a lot of differences between those two in terms of, uh, of risk management. Uh, pluses and, and minuses. Um, if you search for Neil Matson uh, at Cornell, uh, this is one of the guys that has done a lot of research on, especially on the deep water culture system. So if you're looking to get into more detail there, you, you might find his information quite informative. Um, and that leads me to say that we, I, I partnered with, uh, started partnering with Paul Fisher in the Environmental Hort Department back two years ago, and we offer an online hydroponics class um, in one of his series. Um, and it has been really interesting. It's a, it's a four week period. There's eight different modules and it's sort of a, it's, it's not a student credit types uh, class, but it's a, it's a certificate class intended for uh, the industry. And it's been, been really fun to be able to do that. I think a, a quarter of the attendees are from outside of the United States. So we offer it in both uh, English and Spanish. And I can assure you that I'm not on the Spanish provider piece. So Tatiana Sanchez is our extension agent in Alachua County that, that takes care of that component of it. But if you're interested in a lot more detail, that would be one option. We offer it in the fall and uh, it's part of Paul Fisher's online uh, horticulture classes. Sounds good. I'll check it out. Thank you. Hey, I see some lettuce there, Pat. Yeah, I, I, this lettuce is fantastic. I, it is so tasty. And of course, because it still has the roots, it will last until you harvest it. The one concern I have is the amount of plastic that's necessary to market these wonderful uh, fruits and vegetables now at the grocery store, and and the cost of the plastic, I it, I would think it would only be very certain kinds of growers who could afford this kind of really fancy container. But maybe I'm wrong. Yeah, you mean the consumer to afford it? Uh, the, one. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, no, I, it's um, I, I couldn't agree with you more. There is a lot of uh, a lot of 
plastics that would be in, involved with it. They're probably, I'm sure that there are alternatives that are going to come about at some point in time, but um, to keep it as fresh as possible and be able to handle it, the, those clamshells are, are still sort of, sort of the standard for a lot of the bib, bib hydroponic type lettuce that does keep the root attached. So, And it really does work. That's what yeah. blows me away. But I'm, I just wish there were some place to take these containers where I would know they could be reused in some yeah. way um, yeah. it, rather than to recycle them in the trash. Oh. Yeah. What happens there is that the food safety police will come after you reusing containers and sanitizing them before you go back in it. So that it's life has become complicated. Like what you're yeah. suggesting used to be really a good way of, of doing it and reusing this and reusing that. But um, you know, it's, it's just the, the risk and the awareness. And sometimes depending on where they're selling it to um, the regulatory aspect would not allow them uh, to do that. So in some cases, real small operations, less than $25,000 of gross sales in a year, you know, wouldn't have to follow the, all of the audits and things for food safety, but they still would be expected to follow those practices. So, yeah. Um, so yeah, I, you make a really good point. And I think as we see inventions in the future that we'll see, hopefully, uh, you know, some, some better options that'll make you happier. Thank you. <laughs> Bob, I have a few questions from Michael in the chat box. Michael, you can go ahead and ask your questions directly. Um, I have pretty bad uh, uh, audio quality because I'm in my greenhouse with my loud fans. So okay. I don't know if everyone can hear okay. Um, yeah. So because of that, Michael, I'll try to uh, take the spirit of it. I see the first one. Has there been work on nutrient management re for recirculating systems? Ion specific meters to precise auto injections of specific fertilizer salts, so forth and so on. Um and the answer there is yes, uh, and this refers back a lot uh, to my brother's publications over uh, over that period of time. And so, if you search for Hockmuth uh, nutrient uh, uh, solutions for hydroponics, you'll you'll come up with that document, and it's got different recipes in there. It's got a sort of a, a base recipe, but it also has individual ingredients in terms of how you can monitor or manage it yourself. In other words, you can make your own fertilizer mix, which saves you a lot of money if you're a large operator. So um, that I, that will help. Can I ask a more specific question about that? Yes. Okay. Um, so I, I actually, I love your publication uh, and I have been using that now for some time. Um, and we've seen great results being able to dial in the nutrients and our costs have gone down versus a uh, prepackaged commercial blend. So I highly recommend everyone here download that and make it. It's gonna, you know, it's a game changer. But I guess what I'm specifically asking for is, so I have my recipes, but let's say in my large uh, recirculating deep water culture system, I'm recirculating the water over time and I have an EC meter in line that is constantly monitoring EC and it's injecting when the EC falls below a certain set point, it's injecting a little more of that mix that I've added. Now, over time, certain certain salts will accumulate while others will, you know, be managed at just the right level. And so I'm trying to look at how do we, is there research into ion specific meters in, yeah. the, in line that are injecting just that specific nutrient salt um, yeah. to manage over accumulation? Yes. So this is a, a very good question. There is technology to be able to monitor individual ones. It doesn't have to be in line, though. We use our own handheld ion specific meters for nitrate nitrogen and potassium. So we can measure those two specifically, take that solution, and if we needed to make an adaptation to it, we would be able to measure nitrogen and potassium. This, these same meters are the ones that we use for petiole sap testing in the field and petiole sap testing on tomatoes and peppers and cucumbers in the greenhouse. So it's become a, an essential, versatile element for us. And if you if you search for EDIS uh, petiole sap, you'll see the document that I'm referring to, and I'll talk about these particular meters. So it doesn't have to be done in line, but periodically, Michael, you, 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 you get things out of balance enough that you need to just start over again, allow the solution in the reservoir to drop down a little bit so there's not as much wasting, try to find an alternative use 
pump that out and start over again fresh. And uh, depending on the time of the year, that might be every couple of weeks, it might be a month that you that you'd be able to get to it. But we see we see pH drift very quickly as a result of picking up nitrate. It leaves behind a higher pH. So pH drift is really important in nutrient film technique systems. And also potassium, lettuce seems to be a hog of potassium and drops the potassium levels very quickly. So you pointed out something that's a real life deal. Probably don't have time to go into too much more detail, but I'd love to talk to you offline if you have other questions on that. Thanks. You're welcome. Okay. Um, it's almost the time. There's one more question in the chat box. Is there any anyone spearheading use of pre-existing buildings in an urban setting? Mm, I think we're we're headed that we're headed that way. Um, and I think the team that is emerging that has this, uh, you know, has the expertise, uh, Ying Zhang is in the, in, uh, in the Ag and Biological Engineering Department, and that's her specialty. So uh, she's part of this team up here on our in indoor ag project. So she would be one that would be able to help on the in indoor uh, environmental management stuff, you know, uh, the lighting, the CO2 management, those kinds of things. So um, I don't know that she has any specific projects yet, but uh, it is really cool to see where now we have a team of people throughout the university that have different pieces of expertise here to be able to help with that as we move forward. Um, so I think we would use the same kind of te technology and expertise from these indoor pods as you would an indoor building. And I think there's some economies really in an indoor building. You're limited in a eight by 40 foot struck, you know, container. There's only so much you can do with it. So uh, so anyway, it, I, I think that's we're, ju we're just seeing this evolution within IFAS. I'll put it that way. And I think that there's opportunities for that expertise as we move forward. And you'll see in another 10 years, probably another 10 faculty members that <laughs> would be able to contribute to this. OK, I think that's all for today. Uh, we will have the recording available for this seminar if anybody will be interested. I think we will upload it at, on uh, ERDC website. Um, okay. That's pretty much it. Thank you very much, Bob. Yep, you're welcome. Appreciate the opportunity to come, uh, share with you on this. So I look forward to continued, uh, interaction with you if you need. Thank you very much. Um